Today's episode is brought to you by Telecom Careers, the industry's largest resume database and job board. For RCRTV, I'm Sean Kinney and welcome to Wi-Fi This Week. Today we're going to be talking about voice over Wi-Fi. And I'm Martha DeGrasse. Voice over Wi-Fi has been very much in the news ever since last fall when Apple announced support for the technology as part of iOS 8. We've seen all four of the major carriers looking hard at this technology. Not surprisingly, T-Mobile has probably been the most aggressive. But now we're seeing vendors offer solutions to allow even smaller carriers to get in with voice over Wi-Fi. Earlier this week, I had the chance to talk with analyst Klaus Heading about the important role of cloud technologies in voice over Wi-Fi. I think voice over Wi-Fi is the classic cloud-managed service in many ways, right? Uh, because it's, well, because it's an IP-based service and you don't really need the mobile networks to do that. So the classic mobile infrastructure that's used to deliver uh, uh, both uh, today and the LTE networks, the IP-based, but also, of course, the circuit switch, um, doesn't, well, it doesn't apply to the whole uh, idea of uh, voice over Wi-Fi. So, so I think what we'll see is cloud implementations of this, absolutely no question, and we're already seeing that. And uh, of course, Wi-Fi is, in many ways, the technology uh, for uh, dealing with cloud services, generally speaking, because it's really the easiest way to plug anything wirelessly into any cloud that's out there. So uh, I, I think we'll see a lot of that. And we saw some news out of Sweden this week from Aptilo Networks with a voice over Wi-Fi solution. Sean, you've been following that, I think. Yeah, it's a Swedish company, like Martha said, Aptilo Networks, and they've got a new voice over Wi-Fi service platform that they're offering, and it's got a lot of built-in features uh, largely based around security and authentication. And they're marketing as a carrier-grade solution. What's new about... Go ahead. Yeah, this, they, they called it a, a carrier-grade voice over Wi-Fi, which is a pretty big step if, if the company thinks that it's carrier-ready. And, and what that means from a mobile operator perspective is that they can add this tech into their network and it'll allow users with the, the feature on their device or their subscription plan or whatever to go through authentication as they move between hotspots uh, or Wi-Fi networks. So the idea is to be able to offer sort of a seamless transition based on software that runs this authentication protocol. We're seeing a lot of that. We, we saw earlier this year, or last year rather, Takwa, that's another big network player, purchased Kinetto, which had done a lot of device side uh, voice over Wi-Fi solutions. Takwa, of course, is, is in the network gateways and so forth. And we had the chance to speak with uh, Ken Kolderup. He came from Kinetto, now he's part of Takwa. And he explained a little bit to us about that company's solution. Let's listen to that. There's a lot of discussion about voice over Wi-Fi, and there's you know, many different technologies and services that look to deliver voice services over Wi-Fi. Uh, what Kinetto and now Takwa, um, our combined companies, have been doing for quite some time is we look at voice over Wi-Fi uh, very specifically from the mobile operator community mobile service providers. And by the way, that definition of who's a mobile service provider is growing, and that's a whole other discussion. Um, but it is a way for a mobile operator to leverage Wi-Fi as a way to deliver voice and messaging services. Now, the interesting thing from an end user's perspective is it's probably the most boring thing in the world. Um, the whole point of voice over Wi-Fi for the mobile operator is to provide a very transparent experience to the end user so that whenever they connect their smartphone to Wi-Fi, um, they continue to do voice and messaging the way they do today. They make calls using the native dialer in the phone. They send messages using the standard messaging app or make calls using any third-party app that's on the phone that, that makes a, a mobile call. Uh, and what happens on in the background is that those calls will now go over the Wi-Fi radio when you're connected to Wi-Fi radio rather than the macro uh, network. So again, from an end user's perspective, the whole point is to be transparent. Um, the reason the operators are doing it is to try and, try and give the, uh, the subscriber a better user experience for those key services. It is one of the continuing challenges for operators uh, really since the, the onset of the whole mobile industry is, is addressing indoor coverage challenges from the macro radio network. And, and really, you know, in, in locations like home and office where we spend most of our time, that's a very difficult environment to reach uh, for a lot of reasons. And what uh, a lot of operators have discovered and we, we looked at many, many years ago is a, a belief that um, while there is this challenge of coverage, uh, lo and behold, the entire uh, consumer population is building this, this high-performance in-building wireless infrastructure 
around you that's in these exact locations that's difficult. So if there are a way for the operator to leverage those and extend their services over those networks, it can go a long way to solving their, their coverage issues. Right, and that brings up the question of whether operators can can monetize those connections at all. Obviously, if, if people are on Wi-Fi, it's not necessarily the operator's access network, um, but do operators see a way to get value from that, or is it just something that they feel they have to do to maintain their customer base? I think it's a little bit different answer depending on market and, and, and carrier situation. Uh, but for most operators, mobile operators uh, in uh, larger developed markets, the primary reason is not not uh, revenue uh, uh, increasing the revenue. It really is improving the service that you're already delivering. Uh, because one of the and it, this comes down to to churn reduction really. Um, and if you've talked to a lot of operators that are deploying this today, uh, T-Mobile in the U.S. and others are very vocal about why they're doing this. Is it really helps to address an ongoing coverage challenge they have, and that, and that the benefit that they end up seeing is, is a, a reduction in churn. Because if you look at a lot of the studies that are out there, one of the primary reasons for churn is network coverage issues, and specifically, uh, a lot of that is in home and office environments. So I think now, uh, as we talked about before, a lot of these pieces are now in place such that if you just extend your existing voice and messaging services out over Wi-Fi and allow your subscribers to use that, you can go very quickly uh, toward addressing a, a big challenge, a, a part of that uh, that uh, coverage challenge, and therefore um, reduce, lower your overall churn. Right, but but people are going to want to have a seamless experience. So if a person is using voice over Wi-Fi in building and they leave the building, they can't just seamlessly transition to the cellular network at, at this time. Is that correct? No, they, they can. The, the technology does support that, and we have a number of deployments where um, allowing for uh, call transfer or call mobility between the Wi-Fi and the macro network is supported. Um, not all networks do it, um, but some operators are really you know, really want to see that experience. Um, so that you know that that absolutely can happen, um, and I think going forward you'll see more. Most of the deployments actually supporting that that mobility. So there are some deployments here in the U.S. that are supporting that. Yeah, in fact, if you um, look at uh, T-Mobile in the U.S., their their more recent launch with the Apple iPhone um, actually supports handover between their Wi-Fi network and their LTE network using Volte. Um, there's other techniques for doing the handover from uh, Wi-Fi to Volte or from Wi-Fi to the existing 2G and 3G network, and that's one of the unique things that we provide is the ability to support either of those models. So carriers, if you have Volte, you can transition to a Volte network, and if you don't, you're just doing voice over Wi-Fi first. We can allow you those calls to transfer from Wi-Fi to your existing uh, 2G or 3G uh, cellular voice service. Okay, great. That's that's great to know. And then finally, I did want to ask you about the announcement we saw this week from from Aptilo. Uh, they are obviously uh, in the space as well and offering a solution for operators that have deployed IMS already. Can you speak a little bit to the significance of IMS? Is this a prerequisite for voice over Wi-Fi or not? I think there's a there's certainly well, I'll back up a little bit and, and for those that are familiar with what IMS is all about, but there is a an overriding ar new architecture that um, mobile operators are moving toward to facilitate the the transition of their services from circuit based over to packet based, and that is the IP multimedia subsystem, the whole IMS infrastructure that goes along with that. Uh, that does provide them, uh, IMS does provide them with a platform now to start adding a number of new new, new services as well as transitioning their existing services over to the IP domain. Uh, you know, voice is one of those. Volte and voice over Wi-Fi are presumed to be two services that would then be deployed on a, in an IMS infrastructure. So yes, there is a lot of, um, um, that is kind of the prescribed method is to do this in IMS and as we as a vendor, we support that. So we provide core infrastructure to enable voice over Wi-Fi and Volte and other next generation IP services that can be done in an IP environment, an IMS environment. Uh, but one of the unique things we, we also do is we can allow the operator to do this uh, prior to deploying an IMS network and that's a fairly unique thing, thing for us. Um, a lot of operators are uh, have IMS on their roadmap, um, but that's a still a little bit down the road. Um, doing an IMS deployment um, is a pretty significant investment, not only in the products that you need to do that, but uh, the, the deployment of it and operation of it is a fairly significant on-taking to do that. Um, so for, for those operators that are have not yet made that investment, uh, we allow a, our infrastructure to operate in a pre-IMS environment, so you don't have to make that investment yet. 
But yes, uh, we can support either. But yeah, and most people do view this as a as an application or a service that rides in an IMS environment. That was Ken Calderup of Taqwa. You know, another issue that's really been in the news related to voice over Wi-Fi is license assisted access, also called LTE and licensed. The opportunity to use that unlicensed spectrum for LTE um, in really using the same spectrum that Wi-Fi already uses. Um, you know, we've gotten a lot from, from vendors about the opportunities here. We saw Ericsson introduce a small cell technology specifically around LTE and licensed. And some of these companies sort of play in, in both sides as far as Wi-Fi and LTE, including Qualcomm. I think that you've got some information for us on that, right? Yeah, we had a, a big group from RCR go up to the Consumer Electronics Show last month in Las Vegas. And uh, this unlicensed LTE was uh, really a hot topic at the show. RCR's Joey Jackson had the opportunity to visit with Matt Grob from Qualcomm to get an overview of LTEU. Let's listen. LTEU means that we're operating LTE, in other words, technologies from the cellular family, on unlicensed spectrum. So there's really two kinds of spectrum. There's, in a broad sense, there's licensed, which is the kind of spectrum, radio spectrum, that operators like Verizon, AT&T, major wireless operators, uh, they own it. Okay, they purchase it using some kind of auction process or they trade it. It's very valuable. They own it. And when you own the spectrum, you get to say who is going to use it, when, what kind of technology, and so forth. That's licensed. And then there's the unlicensed band. So the regulators around the world say some bands are licensed, some bands are unlicensed. So in the unlicensed band, that's where you see many things, but very prominently is, is Wi-Fi, the 802.11 family. So we're used to hearing about competition for licensed spectrum. Now there could even be a little bit of competition for the unlicensed spectrum. That's why I think it's even more important for these Wi-Fi hotspots to become more and more robust, and certainly the chip makers are moving in that direction. We've heard a lot from both Qualcomm and Broadcom about multi-user MIMO in the next generation of Wi-Fi hotspots, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, again at CES, RCR's Jeff Mucci got the chance to speak with some Broadcom representatives about MU MIMO. Let's take a look at that. So Miriam, uh, Broadcom had a big announcement around your Wi-Fi 4x4. Can you give us an overview and again, at a medium level, tell us what we're looking at here. Sure, absolutely. So we announced our 4x4 4360 Wave 2 wireless chip. It's a 4x4 chip that supports uh, a multi-user MIMO as well as a few other features that are uh, Broadcom specific. Um, I'll tell you what the demo is about and then we'll talk about some of the features. So okay. what we're showing here is a router that's uh, based on the 4366 4x4 uh, chip and uh, a uh, client based on the same chip. And we've, we've configured both of them. We're generating traffic and uh, sending it through this router to this one and receiving it and showing what's going on. Uh, we have a cabled setup over here because in a trade show like this, there's a lot of noise from other access points around and a cable setup uh, gives us some control over you know the noise level in, in the in the environment and as you can see we're getting uh, you know just about a gigabit per second of throughput at this point we have you know throughout the show kind of seen it go up and down and uh, and so that's from the new Wi-Fi chip uh, some of the features that are specific to Broadcom is we've got our special uh, modulation 1024 qualm. Um, it essentially increases the wireless speed to 2.2 gigabit per second now possible. Um, we have a zero weight DFS feature whereby uh, we have the ability to sort of seamlessly enter radar channels and uh, get away from radar channels so it increases the Wi-Fi capacity in the network. And then we also have uh, MU MIMO, which is uh, the ability to serve multiple clients at the same time. Because uh, Wi-Fi originally is a sort of uh, time division multiplexed uh, standard where the airtime needs to be split between different clients. Now with multi-user MIMO, you have the ability to talk to multiple clients at the same time. And that exponentially you know, increases the capacity of the wireless network. Now we have the same setup over there in a shielded environment, um, again, to control the amount of noise that you see. 
And uh, in the shielded environment, again, we have a access point and a client. This time over the air, we're sending and receiving traffic. And as you can see on the screen over here, we're getting close to you know 800 megabits per second. Well, we just installed um, GigaWave service in our new office, and we're probably going to end up with two GigaWave service providers in our office, or our production center for video. Yeah. But in, in the home, if I've got four or five kids, and they're all using their iPads and smartphones, will they? How will the? Um, how will the, the, the router and your Wi-Fi divide the time, or if they're all streaming the same video or different? Right, videos? that's a great question. So, I mean, there, there is there's always the push for more throughput in the Wi-Fi uh, medium, and uh, it is exactly to support that. So, to support you know having multiple users at the same time receiving traffic, and you know your iPad and your iPhone and you know tablets and smartphones are not you know that big consumers of, of throughput, it's when you have uh, over-the-air set-top boxes and whatnot with HD, now you see 4K, you know, uh, TVs and uh, set-top boxes we're showing here. Now we're looking at, you know, multiple tens of megabits per second of throughput. And um, the 2.2 gigabit per second that we're showing here happens at close proximity between you know, the Wi-Fi transmitter and the Wi-Fi receiver. As soon as you go into a home, you have much longer distance between the devices. There is a client you know, on the third floor and an access point on the first floor. So uh, the amount of bandwidth that's available reduces. And that's why in order to be able to even support, you know, 50 megabits per second, 100 megabits per second in a real world environment, you need a chip that's able to achieve, you know, two gigabit per second in a laboratory sort of environment. Thank yeah. you for your time. Yeah. That was Broadcom on the CES floor with an overview of their multi-user MIMO solution. And this has been Wi-Fi This Week. I'm Martha DeGrasse. I'm Sean Kinney. Thanks for tuning in to RCR TV.